Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, so we have to talk today and talk about uh, eight bit methods for efficient deep learning. Um, I added a couple of things to the talk. I think the talk should now be called actually K bit methods for efficient deep learning. Um, so yeah, let me let me get started. So the main sort of goal of what I do in my work is trying to make large models accessible. And if you look at the uh, footprint of large language models. Um, here we have some open source ones. We see that both for inference and for fine tuning need a lot of memory. And sort of in my work, I'm, I'm really trying to reduce that. And um, like two techniques that, that I developed is LLM and Tate, which um, is an efficient inference method and it reduces uh, uh, memory footprint by half. And then APIT optimizes it, uh, reduces the memory footprint uh, during fine tuning. Um, I also will talk a little bit about upcoming work and that makes things really efficient. So there we have four bit models with adapters and then you can fine tune a 65 billion Llama model in a single GPU, which I think will open up a lot of uh, interesting things. Um, but yeah, so in this talk, I will talk about um, four different papers and one sort of in progress paper. And it's a little bit about uh, a new data type I developed, um, then 8-bit optimizers, efficient inference in 8-bit. Then I study like what is actually the be best bit precision for your neural network. And um, then in the end, a very efficient uh, fine tuning method. And so before I go into the meat of these papers, um, a little bit of background. So a lot of my work is on quantization. And so what is quantization? So um, if you see it very generally, quantization is if you have a continuous signal you want to approximate it to um, be discrete. And um, you can see it a little bit like histogram binning. So here in red, I have a normal distribution, uh, a standard normal, and then here you have 16 different bins. And so this is histogram binning, and each bin has equal width. And so what you do um, is um, all the values in a sort of single bin, if you quantize it to the middle value of that bin, then this is equivalent to integer quantization or linear quantization. And so if you have different data types, not an integer, but a float, for example, then you can see this the same way, but now the uh, width of each of these bins uh, might vary. So you no longer have the equal width of each bin, but they might ha have different width um, depending on where they are in the distribution. So the more mathematical definition is um, sort of uh, if you want to have a general definition of quantization that unifies all different kinds of data types. So you have an integer and a floating point data type in four bit, and you can see it as a mapping from um, in indices to uh, values of the data type. So uh, for example, um, you have the indices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, these are represented by a certain bit combination. And these map for the integer or the in four of that um, data type to minus seven, minus six, minus four, and so forth. Um, if we want to unify sort of different data type, we need to put them in the same range. And we do that by normalizing them by the absolute maximum value. And so now they both or all data types are between minus one and one. And now we can also compare them, basically, what the distributions of these data types, if they're normalized. And so with this, we have a general definition. We want to map integers to uh, a range, uh, uh, to values in a range of between minus one and one. And if we want to quantize, we just want to find, uh, if we want to quantize a number, we want to find the index that corresponds to the value that is closest to that um, input value. Um, just to make that clear here, I um, uh, have an example. And um, also just to show that it's very general, I have a, like a data type that's very non-standard. It's not even symmetric. It's a two-bit data type. And so we have indices 0, 1, 2, 3, and the values minus 1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 1.0. Uh, and the input turns us at 10 minus 3, 5, 4. And so the first step that we do is we first want to normalize it into the, the input tensor into the range minus one, one. We do that by dividing by the absolute maximum value. The absolute maximum value is 10, so we divide by 10. The next step is find the closest value in the values of our data type. And then we have 1 0.0, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now that we determine the closest values, we can um, find the corresponding index in the map. And this is basically the bits that we store. 
If you want to dequantize this bit representation, we look at the indices and the corresponding values for these indices and then undo the normal uh, the, the quantization. We denormalize by multiplying by absolute maximum value. And so what we now have is the tensor 10355. And if you look at the input tensor, we have one large quantization error. The minus three turned to two to three. And so this shows that this data type is not very uh, well suited for this input distribution. And um, that is sort of an important consideration. If you have quantization, different data types have different properties and that can give you different advantages or disadvantages. It's always a trade-off, but you need to be sort of conscious what trade-off you're making by choosing a certain data type. And so here I have a floating point data types of eight bits. You always have one bit for the sign. And now we have exponents, which are basically two to the power of the integer value represented by the exponent, and then the fraction, um, which is the fractional component of the number. And so if we have more exponents, more bits for the exponent, we can represent smaller and larger numbers, but each number has uh, is less precise. It has less precision uh, after um, um, basically uh, the, the, co the, co the comma, um, after the zero point. If we have uh, only one bit for the exponent, we have a, a better precision, but we cannot represent numbers that are small and large. So um, both of these data types have sort of different trade-offs. And so to overcome uh, the, the sort of um, disadvantages of both data, data types, I developed a new data type uh, called uh, dynamic exponent quantization. And so this um, works like this. We have, again, one bit for the sign. And now we have the first zero bits are the exponent to the power of 10, or 10 to the power of the exponent. Mm -hmm. Then the first bit that is a one is an indicator bit with no other function, just to indicate that the following bits after this bit represent the fraction. And so um, what we can do with this indicator bit, as we slide it back and forth to a different position, we can uh, change the number of exponent bits that we have or the number of fraction bits. And so with that, we can either rep represent very large and small numbers, or, or we can represent numbers with very high precision. The only downside is that intermediate numbers, um, they cannot be represented with, with high precision. And so that is the trade-off with this data type. And this data type will become important in APID optimizers. It's used in APID optimizers. So uh, a common optimizer is Atom, and Atom has a ratio, and it has very small and very large numbers. And there, this data type can have quite some advantages. Um, but let me first talk about a little bit motivation. Why APID optimizers? So um, here is a representation of the memory that a neural network uses during fine tuning or training. And um, on the left side, you see um, all the values that are dependent both on the number of parameters that you have and uh, other things um, uh, like that depend on other things like the sequence length of your uh, inputs or the batch size. And on the right side, you have the memory um, that is only dependent on how many parameters your model has. These are the weights, the gradients, the main weights, if you have 16 bit. Uh, precision training. And then the atom buffers, so these are the optimizer states. And the optimizer states are quite large. They are in 32 bits, and you have two of them. And um, so if we can transform these optimizer states from 32 bit to 8 bits, we reduce the overall memory footprint by 40%. And that's okay. Um, so that is the motivation. And if we apply sort of 8 bit uh, uh, optimizers, we see like one big problem. And these are outliers. And so here I have a similar quantization as before. It's a four bit quantization of a normal distribution, but now we have one big outlier at minus 10. And so what happens is if you have absolute maximum normalization, is that um, you have one bin that has a single number, the outlier at minus 10. And then all the bins between minus 10 and minus 3, they're completely empty. And this means you have less bins for all the other values, and that increases your overall error. And so because atom is a ratio of uh, optimized states, um, if you have some error, it gets uh, basically multiplied through the, through the fraction. Um, 
that means um, small errors can uh, have large consequences on the gradient update and can lead to instabilities. And so um, this is a big problem. Um, in our work, uh, we sort of avoided this problem uh, by um, doing the following. If you have um, an optimizer state, we take it as a linear sequence, and now we shunk the optimizer state into um, uh, um, chunks of a certain length, and then we do independent quantization for each of these states. And each of these blocks basically has its own absolute maximum value. And that means if an outlier is in a block, we isolate it in that block. The outlier will affect the optimizer states in this block, and um, we have higher error, but all the other blocks are unaffected, and they have high precision. And so with this, uh, we can isolate the instabilities and make them less frequent. And overall, that um, is sufficient to stabilize the training. And so this is a key method. And so here I can talk a little bit about the overhead. So this is the procedure, how you implement um, ABIT optimizers. And so um, the main part is it's very expensive to uh, load things from global memory from DRAM into SRAM, into cache. And so um, the dequantization and quantization is done in cache. And that's about 100 times faster than uh, doing it in global memory. And so that makes it very fast. And so um, basically, uh, in this figure, we assume that our optimizer states are already in cache. And what we then do is we apply the blocks. Then we find the absolute maximum value, normalize it, uh, find the closest 8-bit value, find the corresponding index. Now we store it into DRAM, in global memory, which is slow. Then we do a slow read in 8-bit, put it into cache, and now we do a lookup in cache, in L1 cache. And this is, again, fast. We do the denormalization and, uh, also in cache, which is fast. We multiply by absolute maximum value. And now we have our dequantized optimizer states. And now we can do the next update with the incoming gradients. And so this is this is the procedure of APIT optimizers, and now you repeat this over and over again. Uh, is that clear? Uh, or any questions here? I, I actually had a question. Go ahead. Um, so one 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 thing that I was wondering is uh, you mentioned that some of these errors they seem to be due to outliers that. <laughs> You know, if, if they happen, they might result in uh, major errors uh, during the backpropagation because of the cascading errors, I think. Uh, but then if they are outliers, um, mm -hmm. another a proposal could be, hey, just ignore them. Um, and, yeah. I think, and I think we know when they happen, like we can literally compute the amount of error. So do you think that that would work too? So yeah, I actually studied this. This was one thing that I tried. So in quantization, if you look at other fields, that's quite common, um, um, it, uh, especially if it's sort of with electronics or physics, there's an outlier, you say, oh, you remove them. That This messes up my quantization. Uh, but if you do that with neural networks, often the performance degrades. Um, some outliers are extreme and can lead to instabilities. But if you remove them, it also leads to performance degradation. Some values are very large, but also very important. They are so large because they are so important. So it's important to consider them, to give them space, so to speak. Um, and so removing them actually hurts performance quite a bit. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one so more I, question. One more question. Go ahead. So just to make sure I understand, I understood it right. Is the number of blocks like two to the power of eight, or is that something else? So this is something else. You can choose a block size arbitrarily. Um, yeah, go ahead. Is the number of total blocks two fifty six? Uh, no. So so um, the, so for example, in this paper, I use a block size of um, four thousand ninety six. And so if your tensor has uh, only eight thousand uh, values, then you have two blocks. And so um, the, the how many blocks you have depends on how large your tensor is and what your block size is. It's two. I guess to follow up on that, so yeah. basically, is the idea of blocks, uh, is the idea here that those numbers that are in the same block, they get processed in parallel in a way you want larger blocks uh, so that you can do the quantization and dequantization in parallel for everything in that block? 
Yeah, that that's also one major advantage. So in the GPU, there's a lot of benefit if you can sort of embarrassingly parallelize everything. And this is the case because each block is independent and the quantization runs independently. Um, if you have many small cores on the GPU, you can keep them all busy with no problem at all. And um, that, that is pretty nice. So that makes the entire procedure also a little bit faster. It's not the main consideration because the main consider consideration is really about stability, training at all, but it's a nice benefit to have some speed ups. Um, yeah. If I actually go to the next figure, this looks a little bit confusing. It's a lot of different uh, tasks, um, but here we also see a small speed up uh, all over the board. Um, so the task over here is like fine tuning uh, on natural language processing uh, data sets. We have image net classification, machine translation, um, image net fine tuning, and then language modeling with different size of transformers and masked language modeling. We compare to um, sort of standard optimizers for these tasks. And we find that 8-bit optimizers um, compared to the 32-bit standard optimizers reach the same performance, but um, they save a lot of memory, especially if your network is big. For example, for the 1.5 billion parameter transformer, we save 8.5 gigabytes. And um, the training is also just a little bit faster because um, you load small values from uh, this low memory and do everything in cache that things are fast. And so um, because also of this block sort of architecture, you can parallelize everything very smoothly. And so that makes it the optimizer also faster. Can you explain a little bit more about the process of loading from DRAM to SRAM and you know, where what operation is done in the cache and a little more about that? Yes, yes. So um, if if we go back here, um so um, basically, the initial state is you do a couple of gradient steps, you accumulate gradients, and then you decide, I want to do an optimizer step. And so there it begins basically on the right side with the index. The index is stored. That's the index of the optimizer from the last update. And so then you load, it, um, you load an 8-bit state into, into memory. And so it's basically four times faster than a 32-bit um, uh, optimizer. Uh, because it's four times smaller. So you say four times um, uh, in terms of latency to load that value. Now it's in cache. The GPU cache is about 100 times faster than the global memory. And uh, now you do a lookup. So the problem is um, if you have a lookup, so here we have basically a code board of 256 values. That's actually pretty low on the GPU. And you do it in cache, which is fast. But um, the shared memory cache that we use in GPUs, um, it gets serialized if multiple threads access the same element. And so this is actually a slow operation. The next operation is then again fast, the absolute maximum value and so forth. So the slow thing here is actually the lookup. It's not loading from memory. It's not um, the dequantization. It's a lookup that are sort of uh, in the dequantization that is very slow. And that's happening in cache, but it's, it's, it's a slow operation on GPUs. And so the other operation where you basically store from cache to global memory is the final step on the left, the finding the corresponding index and storing the values. And that's basically what is done in cache and in global memory. Uh, one question here. Uh, can you go back to like the big table? Uh, yes. Next slide. Yeah, for the time column, how did you get that time? Do you actually like train for like 700 days or is it like an estimate? So this, these are GPU days. So um, if you have 100 GPU, you only need to train for eight days. Uh, but um, yeah, this, this is the runtime overall if you would have a single GPU and we ran that basically. And so um, that is also here the next table. So here I have a little bit of ablation analysis on small models. 209 million parameters. These are trained um, on, um, on a single GPU in eight days. And so not that expensive. And there everything looks good if you just have um, um, stable embedding, which, in, which I didn't talk about in detail, um, and the dynamic quantization, which I introduced. And so things look pretty fine. But if you scale up to 1.3 billion or 1.5 billion, um, if you look at the uh, column for unstable uh, runs, it increases to 100%. And so basically all the models crash. And if you introduce a stable embedding, 80% of runs crash. And only if you use a blockwise quantization, 
then things are stable. So uh, this basically means um, you could have done this research with less compute, but some effects are just really only detectable in large models. And um, so you need to be careful um, making generalizations. If something works in small models, doesn't mean it, it scales. Okay, um, this was um, optimizers. Um, the next uh, part that I talk about is LLM and Tate. And um, this is about inference um, of large models on uh, fewer resources. So um, if you look at large open source models, OPT 175 billion, Bloom, and now Solama, um, they are pretty expensive for inference. And um, some of these models, you need to use multiple machines to do inference. And so to just use those models and you need fast networking, multiple machines or GPUs, that's very expensive, especially fast networking can be really expensive. And so if you do it in 8-bit, um, you can do it everything on one machine. And so that's much cheaper, much more accessible. So now we can actually study these models quite uh, well. You don't need complicated software. It's easy to do um, with, with like common software that you find everywhere. And so this was really the goal. And um, let's do it in eight bits. And so you quantize the model, a finished model into eight bits and then just use it. And so if you do that and compare performance, here I have um, on the X axis, the model size uh, in millions and billions of parameters. And then on the Y axis, the mean zero shot accuracy on a couple of tasks. So you just give the model a task and, and ask it some questions and it gives, um, and here you basically score, did it get the answer right? And then you take the mean over a couple of tasks. And so if we do this in 16-bit, everything looks fine. Performance improves as we scale up. If we do it in 8-bit, performance is fine until 2.7 billion. And at 6.7 billion parameters, things crash, things stop working. And then it goes further down and after 13 billion, everything is basically random performance. So um, complete breakdown of, of the function uh, of the transformer. And so this project was mostly about like figuring out what is, what is happening here? What is happening at 6.7 billion parameters? Can we prevent it? Can we understand it? And so um, again, um, you see uh, like a recurring story here, it's outliers. This time it's very special outliers. Um, let me first sort of describe what the problem is with outliers. And that was also basically the problem previously. I showed it like with the normal distribution. Um, if you look at sort of numerically, here I have the same vector, um, the same block, so to speak, and we quantize it. But now I am at an outlier, 3.5, and then I double, roughly double the outlier with sort of every time. And on the right side, I have the int 8 quantization. So in this paper, we do int 8 quantization. And so um, the red zeros show basically information that gets quantized to zero. What is this zero? Um, if you denormalize with the absolute maximum value, it always stays zero. And so this means this information is lost. It's just gone. You cannot recover it. And if you have larger and larger outliers, you have more and more information, which is just erased. It never comes back. And so if you have this for multiple layers, you can imagine that more and more information is erased, more and more information becomes very noisy, that at some point the transformer breaks down. And this is the main thing that we find in the transformer as you scale up. There's some very large outliers and they mess things up. But the very interesting part is that these outliers, they become highly systematic. Um, these outliers change how the transformer works. They change how sparse the attention is, how the attention works itself. And that's sort of a very interesting finding. And because they're very structured, we can actually find a very simple algorithm that works really well. Um, just to demonstrate what it looks like. So what I have here is a slice of a transformer. And this is a slice of the input space of the transformer. And I have on the X axis, um, hidden dimensions or feature dimensions. And on the Y axis, I have sequence dimension of the transformer. So the sequence dimension is tokens or words. And the hidden dimension is, uh, the, the feature dimensions are this, uh, basically the corresponding inputs to a weight. And um, if you look at the inputs of a small transformer with 125 million parameters, what you see is 98.5% of the time, it's just a normal distribution. Just the values look fine. Nothing special. 
1.5% of the time on the very right column, you see some outliers. They're minus three, minus six, or minus seven. And so this, this doesn't look like anything special. And so you scale a little bit up and then the proportion of outliers increases to 5%. And um, there's like five, six, and eight. Then you scale up a little bit more. Now it's 9%. Now you think like, mm, maybe something is wrong here. Why do I get all these outliers? That's already pretty common. And now they're also really large, minus 16, minus 10, minus 27. And then we scale up and it becomes more frequent. And then at 6.7 billion, we have a phase shift. Now, almost every slice of the input has outliers. It's now an exception that everything is normally distributed. These outliers are very large, minus 40, minus 45, minus 61. And the very interesting thing is out of the space shift, the proportion no longer changes. So even if you scale up, it stays at 75%. And um, the outliers increase a little bit in size, um, but that's basically where the phase shift occurs, where the, where the attention changes a little bit its properties, but then it stays there. The transformer learns something and then um, basically uh, finished learning and kept it there. And this is how it sort of looks numerically. If we look at, if you plot this data, this is what it looks like. So we have here two different plots. Uh, one is um, if we scale up models, they usually perform better in terms of perplexity. And perplexity is just to measure how well they can predict words, um, sort of existing data, how similar they are to predicting existing data. And uh, on the left side, we have um, the, the model size in billions. And on the y-axis, we have um, two different uh, measures, uh, the percentage of layers of tokens affected by outliers. So how many layers have outliers that come into the layer? And how many um, uh, sequence dimensions or tokens, how many words are affected by these outliers? And so uh, we see that as we pass this 6.7 billion mark, suddenly 75% uh, of all input tokens are affected and 100% of all layers. So if you pick a random layer, you know there will be an outlier there in the large model. The very interesting thing is these outliers are highly systematic. They occur in the same dimension in all layers. So if I know a certain outlier in a large model is in a certain hidden dimension in a certain layer, I know that this outlier will be there for a future layer in the same dimension. And uh, that makes this very systematic. And so um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight with these plots is um, we see the space shift and looks very dramatic. It goes like from 30% uh, uh, of tokens or 60% of layers to 100% of layers and looks very dramatic. But if we actually plot the same plot in terms of perplexity, it's a smooth exponential. And that tells us something about this process. It's an exponential process that sort of steadily grows. But if, if um, uh, at some point the expo uh, exponential growth is so rapid that it looks like a phase shift to us. And so um, this is basically an exponential process that levels off at some point. And uh, then the transformer has learned what it needs to learn and stays there. And yeah. These, uh, these dots on the, in the, in the, in the diagram on the right side, the dots are associated with batches of data, not models. So these are actually models, yes. So we have all kinds of different models. And so um, one thing, and the, the first what we thought is like, huh, maybe this is a bug. So we looked at different models. And then we thought like, hmm, maybe this is a bug in some software. Then we looked at models from different software, trained with different software. So we have here like, uh, models trained from OpenAI, models trained from uh, Meta, Facebook, um, with their framework, and models trained with uh, open source models trained with uh, other frameworks. And so we find all these patterns in all those models. So with this, we can basically say it's not a software bug. It's not a, a bug with any data or any company, how they do things. It's, um, it's in all transformers. It's a general pattern. And it's not a function of the uh, data type, as in if instead of natural language, if I had like the computer vision data or like synthetic data, it would still emerge. So yeah, in, in this study, we only um, study uh, natural language data, but um, on in a similar project uh, right now, um, we studied uh, language data or clip models, which is language and 
vision. And so in those models, we find the same thing. So my, my hypothesis is this is a property of attention. And so as, as long as you have attention, uh, you find these outliers. Um, we also have a project where we encourage outliers early on. And so what we see is, um, so here things emerge at 6.7 billion. If you encourage these outliers systematically, then it emerges much earlier. But then we also see a thing that it stays there too. So the transformer actually learns faster if you encourage outliers, but at some point it stops there. And so um, it, if I look at the data that I have, it points to that attention is a key part here. So um, it makes attention very sparse and make it helps the transformer to attend to particular things in the input, make things very discrete. And this is uh, beneficial in almost all modalities to select some specific information, to focus on it or contrast it with some other things that you have. And yeah, that's my interpretation. Okay, um, yeah, so, so if these outliers, um, as I shown before, they grow rapidly. This is what our quantization uh, destroys our quantization. And so the other thing is because they're so systematic, they are always occur in the same dimension. We can use a trick. Uh, we extract all the um, uh, outliers um, and um, do a separate matrix multiplication at 16-bit precision. And then we um, uh, extract all the non-outliers, which are 99.9% .9 to do the 8-bit precision. And so once we have these two, um, we add them together. And with that, we can recover the full performance of a 16-bit transformer. But now 99.9% .9 of weights are in 8-bit. So we have the memory savings. Uh, in some cases, we can get some speed ups. And, but now we still have the full performance we see here in blue. The blue line matches the uh, uh, green line. The uh, blue line is our method. The green line is the 16-bit baseline. And so with this, we um, have a small model that is as good as our 16-bit model. Um, yeah, and as we can see, uh, we um, save a lot of memory. Now we can fit models um, that we couldn't fit before. So, um, and now on sort of academic desktops, you can fit a pretty large model, 66 billion. And even on the free cloud, you can now sort of um, use 13 billion models. Um, so that makes things much more accessible. So the next project is about um, the question, if you have a pre-trained language model and you want to use it, you can have a 16 billion parameter model in four bits, or a 30 billion parameter model in eight bits. And so these models have the same bit footprint. They use the same amount of bits. Which model is better? And that is the question that I answer in, in this work. And so uh, why is the bit uh, uh, footprint so important? So in inference, um, the most expensive thing is loading things from the weight matrix. The inputs is, is just a single token. And you need to load the entire model weights into cache uh, for the single token to do computation. And so um, the most expensive thing in the GPU is loading memory. It's not computation, it's loading memory. And so because of this, um, here, here I have a representation. I think it was OPT 175 billion. And so these the weight matrix and the inputs are proportional. And so that shows you that almost all memories in weight matrix. This is the only thing that matters for performance, for runtime performance, for latency, how long it takes to do an inference. And so because the weight matrix is just made of bits, um, if you reduce the total bit footprint of your model, you get faster inference. And so then the question is, how, how do you allocate these bits? More parameters with less precision or higher precision with less parameters? And so, um, in this study, we do sort of a very broad study. Um, we do uh, in total 75,000 zero-shot experiments over multiple tasks. We study models from 19 million parameters to 176 billion parameters. We study different models, then also different bit precisions from three bit to eight bit. We skip two bits because that leads to a random performance. It doesn't work. And we use, we study some, um, quantization concepts like blocking, which I introduced already before, then some data types like the data type that I developed, uh, integer float, and then also quantile quantization, which is another data type. And so if we take all of this and put it together, 
we find this. So here we have an OPT model. And on the X axis, we have the total number of bits in the model. And again, on the Y axis, we have mean zero shot um, accuracy on number of tasks. And we see lines now for three bit, four bit, eight bit, and 16 bit. And now we see that if we um, reduce a bit precision, we reduce the overall amount of uh, bits in the model. And um, it's um, basically, um, we use the same bits if we, if in four, uh, if we have four bit uh, precision and twice the parameters compared to um, eight bit. And so what we find is four bits seems to perform the best. So basically what this uh, plot says is, if you want the best performance, always try to use the largest model and quantize it in four bits. And that's the main takeaway. Uh, the other thing that you see is a three bit, it looks very jagged. Uh, things break down in three bits. And sort of the first thought for us was, are these instabilities from outliers? And so we study this. Um, we develop a method that is similar to LLM and date, <laughs> but which is works independently of the inputs. We call it proxy quantization. And here you have two different models. You see uh, in blue, the three bit, the jagged three bit, and now in orange yellow, we apply proxy quantization. We see um, but that removes a lot of the instabilities and three bit now works, it's much better. But it's not as good as four bit. Four bit is still best. And if we apply proxy quantization to four bit, it doesn't improve performance. So with this, the main takeaway is, yes, if we look at outliers, we can improve three bit quantization, but four bit is still optimal. So the main takeaway is you should use four bits. Don't go through three bits. Um, this is also true if you have more advanced quantization methods. So GPTQ is a high precision quantization method. And here we see the same. So GPTQ and four bit is blue and GPTQ and three bit is in green and blue is better than green. So um, it's also better for other quantization methods. Uh, we also see that if you care about outliers, um, you can almost be as good as these advanced quantization methods that may uh, basically adjust the error based on the inputs that you get. And so uh, this also shows outliers are important. Um, it's uh, most of the problem in quantization, but outliers alone uh, do not give you the best quantization. Um, sometimes you just need more bits and you cannot go lower. Um, okay, uh, the other things that we study is sort of what other things matter, block size matters, um, and data types matter. I won't go into the details. Here we see uh, float and quantile. And uh, maybe I talk a little bit about quantile because um, that is used in the next project. And so quantile quantization, if, if you remember early on, I, I said that integer quantization for a normal distribution is if you have uh, um, bins in the histogram, which have equal width. Now quantile quantization is the same, but you have equal distances in the commutative distribution function of, of your input tensor. And so what that does is basically, it's similar to, you could describe it as a lossy Huffman coding. Um, let me see if I have that here. I talk later about it. Um, but so um, if you want basically each of the bit combinations that you have in a data type and allocate the exact same number of values to each of these bins, um, so basically you want a histogram where each bin has equal amount of values in them, then this is quantile quantization. Um, it has this property. And so what it does is if you get a random, so, so if you want to predict which uh, the next number that is coming from like a tensor from a sequence in which bin will it be sorted, then quantile quantization uh, basically has maximum entropy. You uh, do not know where it will be. You're maximally uncertain because each bin is equally likely that the next number will be sorted in. And so that, that is the main property of quantile quantization. Um, we see later that that can be quite efficient. Um, okay, I don't have so much time anymore. I want to quickly talk about sort of an upcoming project we'll probably finish in a couple of weeks. We don't have uh, sort of a title yet, 
But the main thing is um, now you can take a very big Llama model, get a Shack GPT quality model, and you can get that on a single GPU. So that makes things very widely accessible. You will be able to personalize very large models. Um, you have basically a personalized Shack GPT very soon. And so um, the main thing is that we do in this project is that the memory footprint is so large, it's very difficult to do. So usually um, if you do fine tuning um, a Llama model, it's about 800 gigabytes of GPU memory. So if you have 48 gigabyte GPUs, which are common GPUs like in academic institutions, that's uh, 17 GPUs. And so that's very inaccessible. And so what we do is the following. We take the model, quantize it to four bits. So this is a pre-trained model, that's Llama, for example. Now what we do is we put low rank adapters on top of it. And so low rank adapters have the parameters that will be fine-tuned, and but the four-bit model is frozen. And so if you do um, a gradient step, um, what we do is a, in the backward pass, we pass the gradients through the four-bit model, but we only update um, the low rank adapters, which are in higher precision. And so what that, that does is um, all the weights go to four bit, all the weights that need gradients are very few, the optimizer states are very small, and the adapter weights are very few, usually only a couple percent of the overall parameter that a normal model has. And so what this does is it reduces the memory foot considerably. So now we have a 65 billion model and it only consumes 42 gigabytes of GPU memory. That fits into one GPU. And that is the main um, method that we're using. Um, we also have a couple of innovations for quantization. Um, I don't want to go into this in too much detail. So um, if you quantize with the small uh, block size, then, um, as I said, if your block size is 32 and your absolute maximum value is a 32-bit number, you add basically one bit to your representation. That means your four-bit quantization turns into a five-bit quantization. And so what we do uh, in this project is we quantize the quantization statistics again. And so we take this one bit and quantize it again into four bits. And that reduces the footprint again. And so now we basically use 4.1 bits. And um, we save quite, quite a few um, gigabytes with that. The other thing is, um, if you have contract quantization, this is a general technique for all distributions, for all input tenses. But we can specialize it just for normal distributions. And so what you do is you take a normal distribution you find the quantiles of the normal distribution. And now um, the quantization values and the quantization maps are just the quantiles of this uh, distribution. And if you do this um, for four bit, you have 16 different values. If you see them at the bottom, we call this a normal float, uh, basically a floating point representation optimized for normal distributions, for arbitrary normal distributions that are centered around zero. And that's usually all neural network weights. And so if we look at this, we get very good performance for this data type. Here I have different data types and the mean language modeling complexity, which is a very good proxy for zero shock performance. And we see that uh, we get much better perplexity if we use this normal float compared to a four-bit float. And um, so with that, um, our precision is much higher. Um, we can quantize lower without losing performance. Um, and this is my last slide, just some sort of early results. We fine tune um, 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 a T5 model on um, a supernatural instruction data set, and we basically replicate the full fine tuning performance. We also see that 16 bit base model plus adapters, 8 bit base model plus adapters, and 4 bit base model plus adapters yields the same performance. And that uh, basically says that the quantization error that you have can be um, rectified through fine tuning. And that is an indicator that we actually probably can go more aggressively, even 3 bit maybe with this method. We don't study in this paper, but I think it opens up to even more efficient models that might run on mobile devices and so forth. 
So um, yeah, very exciting direction. I think it will open up a lot of sort of potential to do all kinds of things with, with these very large models. And yeah, that's all that I have. So with these methods, um, you can fine tune efficiently, use models efficiently for inference. Then with the newest method, um, like yeah, we open up fine tuning for chat GPT like models um, to basically everyone. Yeah, thank you. Questions or people on Zoom? I have a question as a follow up to that. Um, so, you, right, the the largest footprint here is the uh, the weight matrix loading piece. Um, yeah. So, so my question here doesn't apply to, to training, only to inference time. Um, but have you given any thought to? Uh, there's a line of work to do model quantization and deployment to not GPUs, but to things like FPGAs or ASICs. Yeah. Like you, you basically you've removed the loading piece to the sort of circuit construction time. Yeah. As, so, so your question is, what the carbon footprint would be on those devices? Yeah. Or if you've given any thought, right, to um, you know to do this quantization and then deployment to devices of that nature. Yeah. Yes. So, what is very interesting about FPGAs is because they're so flexible. If you have data types like normal float, hmm. um, you can implement them very efficiently. So. Basically, this work has one data type for storage, one data type for computation, and the overhead from um, basically converting the storage type to the computation type in cache is pretty fast on GPUs, but it is an overhead. And so in FPGAs, what you can do is you can have special circuits that do fast lookup for these data types, basically um, custom conversion of um, an arbitrary data storage data type to a data type in which you can compute it efficiently. And I think this is like a big opportunity to um, make things faster, make things more efficient, and with that also reduce the carbon footprint. So if you have data types which are storage efficient, um, you need to load less memory that saves electricity. Um, and um, if you have sort of hardware circuits full of this data type conversion, you can do that without any performance penalty. And so you also have to think about the practical aspect like if you have um, the perfect data type, it's not very useful if, if things are slow, people will not use it. So if you want to save electricity, if you want to reduce carbon, then you need to make it both practical efficient and um, have sort of an, um, a benefit in terms of computation. I think this line of work and to combine with FPGAs can go in that direction. So combine, for example, this data type with FPGAs.